we've got a question here. It's a, it's a, it's a beast. Yes. And it is the first question that we're going to tackle today because it's going to take up a bit of the episode. Mm-hmm. And it's a question that could have its own episode, yeah. but we're going to bring this in. So just to, just to confirm what the next questions are, just in case this isn't really a jam and you're thinking, do I still listen? So we've got some questions on about buying ETFs in Australia versus overseas. And we've got another question about DRPs and a question about using broker data. The first question, however, is a big one, which is from Bryce from Port Hedland. Yes. Which is in WA, if I'm not mistaken. So hi to Bryce and all your Bryce, friends if you're Bryce, listening. Bryce, g'day, mate. And thanks for sharing the podcast around with your friends in Port Hedland. Um, he writes in, maybe did you want to read out his question? Yes. So heads up, this is about margin loans. So first, long time listener, first time commenting says, Bryce, with interest rates so low, are more people taking out margin loans and how do they work? I use self-wealth to invest and I'm no doomsday prepper, but I'm considering a hyperinflation hedge via a margin loan. And, yeah. I know you guys don't have for financial advice, but you both put a non-biased lens on things like this for the layperson. Great work and keep those episodes pumping. Which yes. Which we're trying to do. So. Yeah, we're trying to do. So thanks. <laughs> thanks, Bryce. But I thought it was a good question because it got me thinking more about margin loans. It's not something I'd considered for myself. I have been aware. I have dealt with clients that have had them in previous roles, but I thought it was a, it was a good opportunity to dive in deeper to talk about this topic with our listeners and yeah yeah maybe talk about some of the pros and cons because some people in the financial space swear by margin loans absolutely love them promote them uh, we don't really talk about them we don't talk mm. about most forms of debt that much yeah it's true we don't actually and there's a I mean there's a few good reasons for that mm. one of them would be if we say something mildly positive about something that is potentially very risky yeah. and someone takes that out of context it can be pretty um damaging for that person so we we not that we avoid it we just don't necessarily advocate for these types yeah. of things that and often. we believe in making mistakes and making small mistakes but something like a margin loan as we'll explore does can amplify your mistakes if you're yeah. not too sure what you're doing or you haven't worked it all out. So that is probably one of the reasons we haven't talked about it too much, no. but uh, we will get into that. But I thought maybe if we wanted to just start on hyperinflation, okay, because that word go. was chucked in there. Yeah, I, Bryce just inserted <laughs> hyperinflation into there somewhere. I was listening to a fund manager's talk yesterday and they kept using the word disinflation. And, disinflation. Uh, but this yeah, is a little right. bit different. So I don't know if you wanted to quickly explain hyperinflation and maybe Ooh. use an example. Oh, you want me to use an example when yes. it's going to involve some sort of maths. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, right. So basically, I guess the thing is that Hyperinflation is this idea that the price of goods and services goes up quickly, far quicker than any of us um, would like. And you might be thinking, oh, yeah, what's a bit of inflation if this thing goes up by X percent per year? Well, typically hyperinflationary environments result in wars. So it's not normally a good time for people because you end up with people that are in poverty. um, You end up with super high interest rates. And you end up with government policy that puts people out of jobs and so on and so forth. Now, that's the doomsday side of things. So I brought that in, Bryce, myself. Um, the, the reality is hyperinflation is basically just the cost of things going up rapidly. And it goes up so quick that you can't really control it. Mm. So the government in Australia, the government, the RBA, which is the Reserve Bank, and in the US, it would be the Fed. Um, in England, it would be the Bank of England and so on and so forth. What they do is they set interest rates to control inflation. And they want inflation to be around 2 to 3% per year. That's the cup price of a cup of coffee going up very modestly every year. And that basically helps stimulate the economy. If prices are slightly going up, it you know, creates incentives and allows for wage increases and all that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, what can happen in an environment where people have lots of money is inflation can start to creep in and it gets higher and higher and higher. And if that happens at the same time as we have supply shortages which for those of you in the construction sector that are listening to this, you would know this. For those of you that have been trying to buy furniture online. The insane increase in the price of timber. Yep, timber, steel, all that stuff, the raw inputs. Everything like that is going up because of supply constraints. And so what is happening is the price of those are going up. So if you have some timber, you're going to get more money for it because people want it even more than ever. And so what we have is kind of rapid growth in prices. And um, this has many different impacts, but if we can spare the details, basically what happens is uh, the price of a cup of coffee, we're going to use this as an example. If we went, 
if we go down to Vacation, which is one of the really popular cafes here in Victoria, um, Axel's another good one, and so is Loon for croissants. Just get that out there. Um, 50, if, it, if we've got hyperinflation, which might be 50% per month, basically what happens, our $5 cup of coffee goes to $7.50, then it goes to $11 the next month, and then it goes up to $16 the month after. And all of a sudden, four months down the track, your um, cof- coffee is no longer five dollars; it's sixteen dollars. Yeah. And your wages, chances are, haven't gone up that quick. Yeah. And so you're, you're you not paying for that cup of coffee. Purchasing power. That's it. And then the cafe owner doesn't get sales, and then they go out; they lose a job, and unemployment rises, and that's where you see the spiral take yeah. over. And you have to spend that money as quickly as possible because you know the next day it's going to be even more it's expensive worth, to buy yeah, goods. So. Yeah. You have absolutely no incentive to keep any of the money ba- in the bank. You want to buy the goods as soon as possible. So what can actually happen is your currency can actually be less valuable. Mm. And so in some countries where you see this, what happens is people end up buying things rather than having money. So they might buy cars and they just put cars in their yard yeah. because the cars hold more value. And if something terrible happens in that country, at least they could sell the car overseas where they can get an actual currency. So we've seen hyperinflation in Germany before the Second World War. We saw it in Argentina, which eventually then tried to peg its currency to the US dollar and that failed and it was really bad for their country. Um, and basically what, and still they're still dealing with it today, even decades later. And so basically this is a really, it's kind of like a dystopian view of the world. But the reality is it don't happen that often. And what you hear in the news about this type of stuff happening is extremely rare. And the government desperately would not want this to happen. No government anywhere in the world and no central bank anywhere in the world wants this to happen. Um, You know, we saw it in Zimbabwe actually. And today in Zimbabwe, you could actually, you could, you know, for the one US dollar, you might get like a... um, um, what do you call it? A wheelbarrow full of currency. Yeah, I think there was some like quite popular imagery from yeah. that time and people having to wheelbarrow just to buy a, yeah, so a basically, wheelbarrow of money just to buy a bottle of milk. Yeah, so you basically pay for things based on the weight of the paper rather than the actual paper itself. And so anyway, so that's hyperinflation. So people get really um, concerned about this. I've spoken to professional investors that con- get concerned about this. Personally, I'm not as concerned about this. People think that... Um, you know, the price of timber going up and all these different types of things is really important, and it is. But we tend to see this coming out of crisis. You tend to see supply constraints. And so I would say, first of all, that personally I'm not preparing for hyperinflation. So that's good news. Um, second of all, if you were preparing for hyperinflation, a margin loan is probably... Yeah. Even that's like a stacking risk on top of risk, in my opinion. Yeah. Because if, if you really want to prepare for hyperinflation, you need the bunker, you need the baked beans, you yeah. need the everything like that. Yeah. You need maybe to spread your money out overseas. I don't know. But the, the reality is here that hyperinflation, it could happen. I would just say it's extremely low probability. It could happen, but it's extremely low probability. And if we look over the last, say, 100 years to 150 years, that's where I kind of get my base rate and. Not many countries have experienced hyperinflation that have been managed well. So, okay, now that we've had a primer on hyperinflation, which is quite a while, now what is a margin loan? Yeah, so you listeners are very familiar with the idea that when we buy a property, we don't have $500,000 to just go and buy that apartment in Melbourne <laughs> that's yeah. got cladding or something like that. So we have to borrow often 80% maybe more yep. if we have we pay LMI or we have one of the various government incentives. So we might pay 400, uh, sorry, we might buy a $500,000 apartment, but we only have to come up with $100,000 ourselves and we borrow 80% of the money. Yep. So that's, that's a familiar concept. But what banks, because they create various products, you can also get what's called a margin loan where you can borrow to invest in shares, ETFs, managed funds, various products that the bank and there are some other providers that aren't banks that do margin loans in Australia mm-hmm. uh, so it's there worth are. having a look at that but you can actually borrow money which is secured against the shares ETFs you buy and often you might be able to borrow up to 75 or 80 percent and so you maybe you want to have a hundred thousand dollar share portfolio you've got twenty five thousand dollars and then you borrow seventy five thousand dollars 
yep. as part of this margin loan and you can invest it in any ETFs and shares uh, managed funds that the, the bank or the provider has on their books. Yeah. So let's just uh, take stock here. You've probably, if you've been around investing and you've seen the advertising enough, you've probably seen um, things called CFDs. That's um, contract for difference. That's not a margin loan, although it uses margin. So this is where the, the, the lingo gets a bit confusing. CFDs have leverage inbuilt in them. A margin loan is different because a margin loan is actually a loan secured against an investment in shares. So you might say to Comsec or whichever big broker you use or the bank, I want to buy blue chip shares and I've got 20,000. Can you give me the other 80,000 to get to 100? And that is, it's actually a pretty common thing. Um, it's actually a pretty common thing that people would do this. It was very, very common before the um, GFC when debt was super cheap and people could um, basically get cheap, cheap cash or debt, put it into their brokerage account and buy shares. Now, there are many, many risks associated with this. I think the first few things that we need to talk about are how do they work? And Kate, if you can give us kind of the, the simple definition of an LVR, which is something that people will come across, an approved securities list. Yeah. So the approved securities list, if you just Google approved securities list and maybe Comsec, which is one of the big providers of margin loans in Australia, it's really the list of all the shares and uh, ETS, managed funds that the lender is willing. So you might find this really speculative mining company that has a $10 million market cap and the bank might say, hey, I'm not letting you invest yeah. using this margin loan in this company. But something big like A200 or BHP, they might be completely fine with. But the thing is, each security, each share or ETF, the bank will run their own risk assessment and they'll let you bo let you invest in different ratios. So they might... Um, I had an example, um, this is from CBA's uh, approved securities list when I was having a look uh, yesterday on the 22nd of November. So A200 had a portfolio LVR of 80%. So you could, if you had $20, you could use $80 of your margin loan to invest in that company and you would cough up the other $20. Yep. Whereas something like A2 Milk had a portfolio LVR, which... Um, I can read Comsec's definition in a second, but of 40%. So you might want to buy $100 of A2... Milk shares. A2, yeah. Oh, I was talking about Afterpay. I'm mixing up the codes. I don't know what A2 Milk is. But anyway, you could put... Um, if you wanted to buy $100 of Afterpay shares, you'd put forward $60 and they would provide you with $40. So there's different limits for different companies. And so Comsec's definition of portfolio... LVR was if you're in a diversified portfolio with five or more securities. Okay, so I've just looked at the um, the Comsec um, accepted shares list. A2 Milk has a portfolio LVR of fifty five percent, and um, as you said, Afterpay APT is the ticket code um, is forty yeah. percent. So that gives you an indication of how risky those two things are. So we had A two hundred at eighty percent, which is that diversified ETF. They're saying you can have up to an 80% loan on this. Um, and that's a reflection of that being less risky. But they're saying, we'd only give you 40% if you bought Afterpay shares. And that's a reflection of that being more risky. And so the way they calculate these things is probably a bit of science and a bit of art in there. But I would say the basic premise is that you can expect Afterpay shares to bounce up and down all around all the time. Um, whereas, say, with A200, it's a bit more stable, even though it does bounce up and down. So maybe I can just throw it to you then to give us an example. Yeah. So I, I guess I was using an example of you with $100,000 because yep. most of them have a minimum of ten or $20,000 you have to get okay. in, yep. the, in the loans. So they won't do it. They're not going to just do it for $500 because there's a bit of paperwork and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, And it's also worth noting that the margin loans will often have a buffer of around 5%. So because it's really common for the share price to move 5% in a day. Yep. And so you don't want to have a margin call um, where the lender is going to ask you to top up cash or reduce some of your positions. Mm -hmm. So this will give you some having that 5% buffer. So I guess I put an example together of you wanting to buy $100,000 in Rask shares. Yep. So we're pretending they're listed here. Okay, and they're pretending on the that Rask is on the stock market. Approved yep. securities list. So at a 
75% LVR, so you're going to put forward 25000 and the bank's going to lend you, if you're approved, $75,000. So you're going to have um, an LVR of 75%. Yep, makes sense. Yeah, so you're going to contribute the remaining using your cash. Yep. So then if the market falls yep. by 10%, now... This hundred thousand dollars in Rask shares is only worth ninety thousand dollars. Yeah. The bank still, you still got to have to pay that bank the seventy five thousand dollars. It's your, the drop comes out of your investments. Okay. So, so uh, if if I'm investing using a margin loan, they take it's my money is the first money to go. Yep. It's like if we had a house, and the house value fell, the bank gets its money before yep. we get. Yeah. I get my money. Yeah, they right. don't take the fall in the share price. They don't take on that loss. Yeah. So you have to deal with that. Okay. So yeah, right. if your portfolio, so you've bought $100,000 of Rush shares, yep. $75,000 was funded by Bank of Owen or yep. Bank of Kate. There we go. Yeah, Bank of Kate. Kate's Bank giving of me a Kate's like giving this. you $75,000. Yes, please. Then now your shares have fallen. Rush shares have fallen by 10%. So the whole portfolio is only worth $90,000. So this would be drive up your loan to value ratio, which was 75% before to 83% because it's $75,000, which is the amount you loaned Mm -hmm. divided by the total portfolio value currently, which is $90,000. And so suddenly because your LVR is 83% and if we've got that 5% buffer in, that would only take us from 75 to 80%, you've suddenly above your limit. So the bank's Bank of Kate is going to call you up and say, hey, Owen, you've got to top up your loan with some cash to bring your loan value ratio back down to 75%. Okay, and so this is the margin call. Yes, I'm this going to This is when they say, they, they call you and they say, hey, you need to put more cash in or we're going to sell some of these shares. Yeah, or you might have to sell some yourself. Yeah. Um, before, otherwise, if you don't take action within 24 hours, how mu- however long I decide to give you, mm-hmm. it'll be in the fine print. Yeah. We'll just sell the whole portfolio from underneath you and take the money. Yep. And so they're always in control. Yeah. And if it's fallen significantly and it's the total amount available is less than the amount we lent you, you're going to owe us some money. Yep. So this is just like if you can't pay the loan on your mortgage, mm. the bank will sell the house for you or on yeah. your behalf. But at, at least with that, it doesn't happen that quickly. There's yeah. a, quite a few processes and there's hardship things. And this can happen. Like I had a, a friend who was investing throughout 08, 09 during the market crash, but he was on an overseas holiday and he wasn't contactable. Yep. And so suddenly the market crashed. He had no idea. He was in the middle of nowhere and the bank couldn't contact him and they just sold his whole portfolio out from underneath him. Oh, wow. So that is one risk, like quite prominent risk that you have to be able to manage this. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So we've got hyperinflation, which is a big one. And then we've got margin loans, which is like a loan on your house, mm. except the bank can pull it out from underneath you. Yeah. And um, then you can also reduce your LVR. So you could borrow less from the bank to begin with, which gives you a lot more wiggle room before there's a margin call. Okay. So right. you could say, I want to buy $100,000 of rash shares, but I'm only going to borrow $50,000 from the bank of Kate, yep. and I'm going to cough up 50000 myself. Then your loan to value ratio would only be 50%. So... Rash shares would have to fall so much more yep. before the bank gives you a call. Right. Okay. But you don't get... So most people would want to do the maximum LVR because then they get the maximum amount of buying power. Yeah. But that's the maximum amount of risk for a margin call. Yeah. Right? So different um, lenders will have different maximums and you might be... Like a bank might only approve you for 70% of the, the loan value. They might choose, oh, we're only going to lend you up to mm. a 50% LVR. Um, we're going to give you up to $30,000 or something like that, depending on how they feel about you as a, yep. a borrower. Yep. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the pros and cons. Yes. Um, and um, maybe I'll start with one. We've got Monique here in the studio with us. Um, hey, Monique. <laughs> and um, we're talking about how we could use an example. And um, basically, anytime you use debt in investing or to do anything, you're basically, it's like you're plugging your, your guitar into the amp and if you're a terrible guitarist, no one wants to hear it, but you've plugged it into the amp, you know, it's going to be loud. Mm. Things are going to go wrong. Sounds so, even worse. Sounds even worse. 
But if you're a good guitarist, plug it into the amp and it's going to sound great and everyone can enjoy it. This is like investing, except the thing is no one's really that good at investing all the time that they can use this much debt, at least in my opinion. And so there are a few people that should use margin loans. That's my short answer to it. Um, I don't use one and I don't think I ever will. Um, and I'll explain why in just a minute because I think there's better ways to do it. And there's a famous in investor out of the US called um, Tom Gaynor who works for Mark Hell Corp. It's an insurance company. It's like a mini Berkshire Hathaway. And he basically says that he avoids companies with debt because it's like playing poker and then someone can take the cards out of your hands at any time. Yeah. And that's basically it. You're playing poker where someone can take the cards away from you and typically they take the cards away from you at the best time to invest so when it's when things have fallen is the worst t- time to sell it's the worst time to sell and so you do never you in investing you the probably the number one rule is never be a forced seller never be someone that's forced to sell an investment because if you are a good investor you don't want to put yourself in that situation and we saw this during covid when even companies that use debt they were like weighed down by this anchor of paying interest at the same time as companies without debt were able to invest more money. So you do not want to be in that situation. That's just my kind of overall opinion. But Kate, what are some of the pros if we're trying to be balanced? As Bryce said, we do try and take an objective lens to these things. If we're trying to be balanced, what are some of the reasons why people would consider a margin loan? Yeah, the first thing, which I think it's not as relevant now that ETFs are available, but diversification, when you could only buy individual shares, if you only had 20,000 to invest, maybe you could buy a handful of different shares. But if you wanted to diversify your portfolio even more and buy 20 different shares, maybe you don't have enough capital to do that. So by having a margin loan, you've got more funds to play with and invest. Um, The second one is leverage. If you want to, if you know what you're doing, uh, amplifying your, your gains, and you do need to take into account the fees. Now, we haven't even mentioned fees, but the bank doesn't do this for free. The bank is taking on risk mm-hmm. and it generally costs more than a loan for a house, the, the interest you're going to pay per because year. it's riskier for them to lend it to you. Yeah. Um, access to that larger pool of funds. Um, it doesn't need to be secured against a property. So sometimes when you have loans, they'll secure it against. They'll say, well, we'll only give you a loan, but... If something goes wrong, we get your house. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to do that, but they are secured against the equity in the bank uh, or the lender does have a lot more control to sell it underneath you. Yeah. So you do lose a bit of control. Uh, they can be a good tool. And I know there are people that do promote it on their podcast, but you know, in a bull market, like when things are going well, margin loans can make things go even, even better. better. Yeah. But the tables can turn quite quickly. And another thing is that Interest charged on a margin loan is generally tax deductible. And I've linked to the ATO resource on that so you can learn more about that. Yeah, so we had Chris Bates on the podcast as the mortgage broker and he basically said that he would never buy shares with cash. He would always use debt. Yeah. And the reason why he said that is because if you can use debt to invest in shares, you can claim the interest. Um, It's kind of like negative gearing. Mm. It'd be interesting, I think, because often people that are more experienced property investors and are used to that debt and um, leverage cycle that maybe mm. a margin loan is a bit more comfortable. But for me, who's never bought a property, who's not really used to debt, um, taking on more debt to buy shares, I, I, that concept's a bit weird to me. Yeah. So I'll tell you why I d- wouldn't use a margin loan in just a sec, but I'll just go through some of the cons that we've got on the list here. The additional risk that you would take by uh, using leverage. So just as you said, it magnifies the gains, it can magnify the losses. Um, the lender can change the rules, lowering the maximum LVR, removing securities. So if you bought after pay today and they say tomorrow, no, no longer, that's that's no longer allowed. Um, the interest rates on these things can go up and down, um, typically up when you don't want it to. And margin calls in market declines. You may, you know, I think this is the, the key question is when the price of your investment falls, because investments do fall, they inevitably do. Do you have enough money to keep the position active or will you be that forced seller? And, and if you take the maximum market. LVR available, whether that's 75% or 80%, if the market falls by 30%, you could be in for quite a significant market co- uh, margin call in a market crash. And so you would have to come up with a lot of money, which you might not actually have sitting around. And you don't want to be just raiding your emergency fund. That's it. So those are some of the cons. Now, um, if I could be 
so simple as to suggest that if people are actively considering doing this, first of all, get advice. But second of all, if you have a home, I think the better way to do it is to use a line of credit against your house because you, you get lower interest costs. So if you, can use, if you have equity in your home, you have to have a certain percentage of equity in your home. You may be able to use a percentage of that money to then go and invest in ETFs and buy shares and that sort of stuff. And what you can do is you can claim the interest because it's an investment typically. I believe I could be wrong. We should refer to the ATO page on that again, just to be sure. But um, I'm pretty sure you can um, at least offset po- a, par- a portion of it. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that there is no margin call because you can your property is security, so you can use that instead um, as kind of a backstop for the bank. So if your shares drop, the bank only sees the loan against the property; they don't necessarily see the loan against the shares. Um, but still, I mean, all the same rules apply, Yeah. right? You can't just, you don't want to just go out and buy crazy companies that just go and fall and put you under a lot of stress, but that is probably how I do it. And we covered this with Chris Bates in the podcast not too long ago. And I think investing is already risky. Investing in individual shares and small companies is even riskier. Like why add an extra layer of risk and uncertainty and admin to that whole thing. And I think I just wanted to mention the interest cost because that is an important part of the equation, but I'm just looking at Comsec's website now, November 21. Um, The variable rate is 5.5% per annum paid monthly in arrears. Uh, There is that tax deductible component, but you do have to do quite well in your investments to make that worth it beyond the typical returns you'd be getting already. Well, the thing is, so if it's say 6%, You've got to make 6%. That's, well, excluding tax, let's say your tax rate is 30%, you might have to make 4%. And so it's always very alluring because it's always just within grasp that, you, oh, yeah, I can make 4%. Yeah, I can make 5%. And so I remember quite a few years ago, this could be back maybe five to 10 years ago, this investor that I didn't really know, but he was a really good investor, he said, you could almost just go and take out a home loan and buy Telstra shares because the dividend's like 8%. And he's like, you could get the franking credits, which would make it like 12%. And then you could claim the interest on your loan, which would be like, you know, even less, like 3%. So he's like, as long as, long as Telstra pays a dividend, you're making money. And I thought about that and I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But Telstra then eventually cut its dividend and all those types of things happened. So um, it's just important to be prudent with these things. And there are other ways to do it. I would say... CFDs are a really quick way to blow up your money. Um, they even say that on the advertisements that most people lose money. Yeah, in the fine print. <laughs> yeah, they say it has to be on like the ad and it says like 70% of people lose money or whatever it is. We don't know the exact number, but um, yeah, it's crazy. Margin loans can, be, can, can work for prudent people. I don't advocate for them. I, maybe some people do. That's, that's fine. I would be more inclined to use a stable asset to lend against rather than Um, a liquid asset like this that has margin calls. That's just my two cents on the topic. It's a great question and it's basically an episode in itself.